Thank you everyone for joining us this month um, for our University of Idaho, Utah State University, and University of Wyoming a sheep and goat extension webinar. Uh, we've had a lot of success with this webinar and we're really grateful for your guys' participation. Um, today, we'll have uh, Dr. Melinda Ellison talk to us a little bit about integrated farm management. And we're really grateful um, to have you guys and to have uh, Dr. Ellison today talk to us. And we hope everything is going well on the farm. Um, it's a kind of busy time of year. So those that are with us, uh, we really appreciate that. Okay, with that, um, Dr. Ellison, I will give you the time. Thank you. Great, thanks, Chad. So today we're jumping into one of the conversations that probably isn't the most exciting of conversations, but one that's really important from a business perspective um, when you're raising sheep and goats, especially if you want your enterprise to be profitable in some way, right? So um, when we think about integrated farm management, there's a lot of things that come in my mind as pieces of what happens on the farm. So anything from your financial planning, marketing, all of the human resources, anybody who works for you or family members who may um, be a part of the business. Um, the community engagement in some cases is really important to a business. Um, we look at energy efficiency and uh, byproduct and pollution management. And we also have to go into all of the resources that we have available to us on our farms, all the natural resources, water and soil resources. And then of course, if you're growing any sort of crops or um, hay or just pasture for your animals. And then finally the animal part. And I think a lot of times we get tied up in the animal side of things and we don't remember that all of these different pieces are playing a role in the success of the farm, in addition to the fact that all of these things need to be well documented so that you can go back and look at them and make sure that everything that you're doing is actually the most efficient and the most profitable on your operation. So if you look at any one of these things, they're all going to tie into one another to create, if I would have put arrows between everything, obviously a big web of, ways that things feed off of each other within the business um, and, and how we can manage the best way possible. So one of the things that the best businesses and the best you know farms and ranches are doing is making sure they have a really solid business plan that they're um, working hard to put together and then repeatedly on an annual or even semi-annual basis, returning back to that plan to make sure that they're meeting objectives and you know being as good as they can be within their business. And so we're going to talk about what that looks like today. And like I said, this might not be the most riveting conversation in the world, but it's one of the most important things to do if you want your business to be successful. And so we're going to start kind of at the beginning where why do we want a business plan? What is What are we achieving by by putting together a business plan. So the biggest thing here is we want to set direction for our business. If you don't have an end goal of some kind and you're not aiming or shooting for that end goal, then you don't know, for one, if you're meeting your objectives and also if you're doing it in a way that's efficient, a way that's profitable, a way that is feasible. And we also can put together a business plan if we're starting a new venture, whether it's a brand new farm or we're going to add a new piece of uh, property to the existing farm, or we're going to add more animals. And we can also identify some of the shortcomings that we have in our existing management. So we can develop the processes in which we're going to move the farm and the different business aspects forward, and therefore increase the profitability of the farm itself. And so another thing that's really important when we think about the future of a business is if there is ever going to be any sort of business transitions, and of course, the inevitable succession planning that should take place before somebody passes so that it's all just set in stone and it's an easy transition, right? Um, the other thing that we can use a business plan for is having 
our procedures laid out for us and our goals laid out for us so that in the moment we don't do as much emotional decision making and we make decisions based on what our actual objectives are and how we wanted to get there. And of course, in the process of this business plan, you'll have multiple um, alternative strategies as far as the management and how you wanna get there. And so of course it could be a little bit fluid, but still having those objectives laid out in a way that you know, we know what we're doing, we know how we're gonna get there, and then we just put that in motion. Another thing, especially for people who are wanting to grow or invest or do any sort of um, new farm venture, putting together a business plan is pretty much essential when you're looking for a creditor or an investor in your in your farm. So this is something that if you already have it in place and you think I'm gonna buy that. 40 acres next door or whatever it is, and you want to take it to your banker, it's ready and and it's just tailored in a small way rather than having to put the whole thing together. The other thing is, is if you're big enough to have employees on the farm, putting together those different procedural operations through this business plan so that everybody is on the same page and we're making decisions that fit within the objectives of the farm operation. So when we're putting together a business plan, the first thing you wanna do is define your mission. We're gonna establish objectives from what that mission may be. And we're gonna walk through all of these. We're gonna assess the resources that we have available to us currently on the farm. We're gonna identify the opportunities and threats that we have potentially coming our way on the horizon. We're gonna look at all the different strategies that we could use to get to the end goal. And then we're finally going to select the right strategy for our business or our goals, and we'll implement that strategy. And one of the things that we often forget is to evaluate this plan and make sure it's really working. And did you really meet those objectives? And how well did you meet those objectives? And then if they've been met, should we be changing our objectives as we move forward? So it's really important to go back and review this every year or more um, to make sure that we're hitting all the targets. So when we're talking about our mission, it's really important to define a couple of things. What product and service are you wanting to sell? What is the demand for those products and services? So, you know, for a sheep or goat operation, we're probably doing some kind of meat or wool or milk sales, or maybe a seed stock uh, operation. And so these are just the the parts that you want to make sure you have well identified and they may be multiple of these that you would like to offer to your consumers and at this point then well once we've identified that you look at what objectives you have are you looking to meet a demand for a product or a service or do you just have it available and you have a good quality product so you're able to provide that to them or both the other thing that is important is who. Who are we going to sell to? And what are the markets for those um, services and products? So, you know, this is all something that we probably have all been doing or thought about. And this is the point where you can write it on paper. What do I sell and who am I selling it to? And are these people that I'm selling to, the consumers, the appropriate consumers for what I have available? And the other thing is, why are we in business? So obviously we wanna make money. That's one of the main ones, but there's also a lot of other ways that your business could be important to you. So family stability or security, providing multiple um, different people with employment opportunities, perhaps if you're a large enough operation. Um, and even beyond that, if we think about my, my business of selling um, slaughter lambs means that I support the local butcher and I support, um, you know, whoever in the community as well. And then obviously if it's a needed product or service, you're providing that to others, but also the lifestyle, which I think for a lot of people in, you know, agricultural systems, the lifestyle is really important and it's what drives us to do what we do. So we put this all together, the who, what, and why, and an example of a mission statement can just be that the mission of the farm is to provide quality finished lamb direct to consumers while providing family income and a flexible lifestyle. So that may be one of the smaller farms that's maybe the side um, farm to a 
full employment job or or whatever. The other might be something a little bit bigger where we're going to have a goat dairy operation that provides employment opportunities to people and produces products and services that are meeting the needs of our consumers. So this is just a simple exercise to put together that what, who, and why scenario. And from there, then we can talk about the objectives of our farm. You want them to be quantifiable. If you can't measure them, then they're not really objectives. They're just, you know, <laughs> fluff, clouds, something you would like to aim for, but you don't actually know when you really get there, right? And you want them to also be simple, but you can have many objectives that you're aiming for at the same time. And of course, like I said before, you wanna be able to evaluate whether you're meeting the objectives so that you can look back and say, why did I fail? Or why maybe did I achieve this in half the time that I thought I was going to? So you have a good idea of what works and what doesn't work. So moving forward, you have a better opportunity to become more profitable or grow or whatever it is that you're aiming to do. So again, objectives can be fluid. So as you meet an objective, you can add another or change your objectives based on where you are in the system at the time. So an example would be to increase the lambing rate to 1.8 by 2024. Or maybe we want to increase the number of return buyers that we get by 25% within the next year. Or maybe it's as simple as I have a wonderful farm and we're very profitable, but we are just short enough that we can't provide health insurance to our employees. So that's something we're going to work on, right? So the next step in writing a business plan is to assess what you have already available to you on the farm. And so this, I think, is probably going to be one of the most challenging pieces, but also the most rewarding. Because um, if you sit down and actually look at the different things you have available and put them on paper, and there's a lot of ways you can do that, but you sit down and say, hey, George, who works for me, is a really, really good herdsman. Um, but maybe he is not very good at um, you know, showing up to work on time or whatever it is. But you put that down as the things that they're good at and the things that they have limitations on so that you can strategize to maybe use them in a different way to be more efficient, more profitable. Looking at the facilities and equipment you have available, I think um, a lot of times there's a lot of things that we have available to us that we don't even realize because we haven't sat down and thought about it, right? Or maybe if the barn was just 10 feet longer, or maybe if we had another barn or whatever it is, it's important to sit down and decide that for yourself with your business. Also your resource base, if you're starting with, um, you know, a hundred animals, do we have enough to do what we want to do for our objectives, right? Um, the ability for you to market your products, the financial position that you're in, which we'll talk about in a minute in more detail, but that's a really important piece that can tie into all the things we've talked about so far. And also anything that we look at, are they limiting our ability to meet the objectives that we've now set forth for ourselves? So going back to the financial side of things, I am not an economist, so don't <laughs> mistake me there, but it is one thing that I have personally done on my farm to go through all of these different pieces to get this you know, financial summary available to me. And it's very eye-opening. And so I would encourage um, you to Google you know, how to work through this worksheet or sit down with your banker or your accountant and really go through it. Because when you talk about, we all know money in, money out, but what is that specific money in, money out doing and how some of them should be included in your profit for the year, or maybe it should be you know, accounted for over a period of time. I mean, there's a lot of things. And like I said, I am not qualified to walk through each of these and tell you what the numbers mean or how to get there. But I have done it for myself before. And it was really, really helpful for me, especially when you look at your debt to asset and debt to equity ratios, because what you do is you provide every asset that you own from, you know, your pickup that you used or your trailer or the barn that you have but you go down even to like the buckets that you have in your place or the different feeders and, and different things that you have within your operation 
that are assets to you, right? And they're they're a value. And then those are not liquid value necessarily, but they are there and they are value in your system. So you can get an idea of how truly profitable you really are. And if you're in a place where you can expand financially to bring on, on more of a of an, a bigger operation. So there's just a number of things you can look at and I would encourage you to do it even if you're not applying for a bank loan or any of that because it is very eye-opening. The other things that you have to look at are the external environments. And of course, all of the things that I'm about to lay out for you can also be benefits, but they're also going to potentially be risks to you and they're out of your control. But it's still important to think about what happens if, right? So for example, we all just went through a major drought. So that was a big one. If we didn't account for that, then we probably lost a lot of money last year. Um, the economy, it's volatile and it will go all over the place. If you're looking to expand and you're in a high interest rate period, that's probably not the right time to expand. Two or three years ago when we had really low interest rates, so keeping, um, keeping an eye on that, but also being able to account for it as you're moving forward with your objectives, because these things can happen without you even seeing it coming, right? Um, consumer demand can change in a heartbeat. I mean, we saw a shift in the sheep industry in the last couple of years that was really, really beneficial for us, right? But it could go the other way in just as quick of a, of a time frame. So making sure that if I'm going to grow my flock to X size and I'm barely meeting, I'm barely, you know, able to meet the demand that's there. But what happens if the demand cre decreases by 20%? Now, do I have extra animals that I can't get rid of? We just have to make sure that that's accounted for when we're looking at the different strategies for management. Obviously, government regulation can change in a hurry and technology. And while it's always getting better and making things a little easy for us, is it, a, is it affordable when it first comes out? Should I wait two years, pay a little bit less money for it, or should I do it now and it'll make me that much more money? So these are all things to consider as your external environment. And of course, anything environmental, hail, <laughs> tornado, random animals dying, it's just all needs to be factored in. And one of the things that's important to do is you're looking at this business plan on an annual basis in most cases, but you also want to be able to identify in 10 years, how would something happening affect me 10 years from now or five years from now? So when we're looking at the alternative strategies for our management, that's what we include. So I'm sure at this point, you're all thinking, this is a lot of work. I don't know if I really want to do it, but it's so important because if you want to be one of those top business people that's making a lot of money on your sheep and goat operation, these are the ways that it happens, right? So when we're looking at all the different things that we need to include in the different strategies, I'm going to go through some of these, but not all of them as we go through, just to give you an idea of what you should be thinking about as you work through them. But there's so many things that can go into it. There's probably more of them for some of you. Some of you may not utilize all of them because it's not a part of your system, but just thinking about it from all these different facets is really important. So we'll talk about marketing first, because I think one of the places a lot of people fall short in agriculture is being able to market themselves really well. So if you sit down and think, what is it that you can offer a consumer? And there's so many different things. So we've got, you know, the obvious meat, milk, wool. Are these animals going to be available to people or the products we have year round? Or can we give them only a, sell them only once a year? Do we have any sort of unique thing that we can apply to our animals to get us into that niche market? How much do we have available? And is the demand su supporting the supply that you have? Also the distance, you know, one of the things we've talked about extensively in this webinar is that we don't have enough sheep and goat processing plants. So is it, is it profitable to be offering what you're offering given 
where you have to take them and how do you overcome that? And then also, are you having criteria to maintain your product and your price consistently so that people know what to expect from year to year? And that gives you those repeat customers that are really important, especially if you're in niche marketing. So when you're looking at all these things, when you're talking about different marketing strategies, consider like, what if I just did the traditional marketing where I sold all of my lambs to um, a feeder and then they took them to the plant and that's how it goes. So what does that look like financially and from a labor um, standpoint? Do I have the existing facilities and equipment and what things could happen that I'm not in control of as I'm working through these strategies? Maybe now I'm going to hire somebody to be a marketing strategist for us and we can um, use that person to make more money. So what's the break even? How much would you need to make extra from the first strategy to pay for your marketing person, or maybe you're comfortable with marketing. So these are all things to think about, but look at all the different ways that you could do it and do the pros and cons. And a lot of times labor is a perfectly acceptable reason not to use a strategy because it just takes too much time, right? But what is the benefit if you were to take that time? And that's why we do the alternative strategies so that we can get a really good feel for what would truly be the most profitable for my operation. But this also comes with understanding the different regulations, you know, government regulations and, you know, crossing state lines and all the different things, being aware of what that means and how you're going to overcome it. And then also understanding how you're going to advertise to the people that you're targeting. And there's a number of different ways to do that. I mean, traditional marketing, you can do direct sales, go to auctions, you can do some branding um, with some of the different uh, projects that are going on. You can highlight the things on your farm that you're really proud of. Like um, if you're a grass finished producer and you wanna highlight the types of forages that they have, I mean, there's a number of ways to get people really excited about your product, you know, local product, whatever. And, and having that marketing person or you be the marketing person, having websites and social media and various other ways to target people is really important if you're going to go into that niche marketing. But what's it worth to you, right? Are you going to actually make more money off of it? And if you think about your facilities and equipment, this is where your big money comes in if you're going to be expanding, of course, because that's um, the biggest investment is having facilities and land to support the animals that you have. So what do you currently have and what do you need to be able to meet the objectives that you've outlined? And so looking at all the different potential facilities and equipment that you need for handling and moving and various things, grazing, feeding, and then how are you going to pay for them? And is it going to ever catch back up if you are to expand? Are you going to ever be able to pay it back and actually make money off of it? And so sometimes I think we start with objectives and maybe we're looking for pie in the sky. And then we get to these stages where we think that would be wonderful, but I don't think I can do it. So then we go back and we address our objectives and start over. And just another example is, you know, if we're changing the type of product or service that we have available, do the animals that we have currently support those objectives? And do you need to change how many you have or what kind you have um, to be able to meet those objectives? And, and what is the payoff there? So the same thing is having that criteria in mind when you go to purchase animals or cull animals, um, and you, you know, you can get into doing some of the genetic work, the EBVs, but it's important as you're growing an operation to have really good set criteria for culling and selecting. So I won't get too much in the weeds on that, but it's just um, something to think about. There's two places that I think are going to be the most impactful to your bottom line and to your animal health when it comes to the animal side of um, management, which is 
the nutritional side, what do you have to feed them? What do you need to feed them? And how do you know that they're getting that balanced ration and that you can also afford to pay for it? So it's kind of that balancing act, but good nutrition is so important when it comes to production and the animals being able to give you what they what you're expecting from them. So between, you know, feeding them properly, whether you work with a nutritionist or work with one of your extension um, people, making sure that you reevaluate periodically throughout their life cycle to make sure that you're meeting different uh, requirements. You know, lactation requires a lot more nutrition than, you know, just grazing out in the field with no lamb or kid on them, right? So, and making sure that they have a balance of vitamins and minerals, because this is where you're going to lose a lot of production without even really knowing why. So whether that means a lower lambing rate or um, the lambs coming back 20 pounds lighter at the end of the season or whatever it may be, this is where your bottom line is getting hit really hard, but you can't necessarily see it until you improve and see the difference. So to me, this is where having that good, consistent feeding process provides you with a consistent product that you can make available to your consumer to allow them to want to return to you. And the same goes with health. And um, this isn't really about health and nutrition, but they're just really important things to think about because it is an investment on your part and you have to make sure that the investment will pay off. But just know that shorting them on health and nutrition will cut your bottom line. And so it's important to think about up front. And again, with the biosecurity side, um, this is where you can really get in trouble from that environmental standpoint. Having a really good system for your biosecurity will help you to not have some kind of disease go through your animals or you know, maybe disease even within your family because sheep and goats are often having zoonotic diseases that you can contract as well. And so when you look at the business plan, this is also a great opportunity when you are looking at different strategies for management to create these operational procedures so that people who work for you or different members of the family, it's cut and dry. And this is how we're going to do it. And this is what we expect from you so that we have the best bottom line and the best animal health and et cetera, et cetera. So that's why it really takes a lot of work at the front part of it. But then as you move forward, a lot of these things are going to carry over. So to me, it's worth sitting down, making sure that you really have a good idea of what your business plan should look like, what different strategies you could implement, and then choosing the one that in theory will be the most profitable. But then at the end of the day, if you do all that work and you didn't keep any records and you didn't go back and look at it and make sure that you you were able to really improve in some fashion, then it was all for naught. So to me, this is one of the most important pieces is looking back on your records, doing some various calculations, keeping up on that financial planning aspect so that you can truly understand, did I make more money with the in, maybe an increase in inputs? Or maybe you started this whole thing and found out you're inputting way too much. <laughs> so you cut back on inputs and did it end up penciling out for you? So with that being said, um, I think that's all I have for you, but I wanted to touch bases on this topic because especially for anyone new to the business or somebody who's getting more serious and wanting to expand, this is a super important piece of the business side. Um, and if you get to a point where you hire an accountant for the business or even just for taxes, they're going to be so much happier with you <laughs> when you can bring this to them. So. Um, I will take any questions that you guys have at this point. And Chad, you're the one who knows if that's a thing. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Melinda. I I feel like I gleamed a lot from from this talk and you know, just making sure that we evaluate everything we're doing. I mean, this goes along a lot with talking about record keeping, right? And so um, how often do you think we fail to match the animal 
aspect with the resources that we have. I mean, I think sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, um, you know, maybe a certain breed or a certain species of animal may be better suited for our resources environment, um, but we try to make it work with something else. Yeah, you know? I think it happens a lot. And that's why I hound it so hard on the marketing side too, because if you are trying to provide a product that the consumer wants, then you have to tailor your animal to that rather than vice versa. And the same goes for the resources you have available, which is why it's really important to sit down and say, hey, I have, you know, 80 acres of pasture that I can put my weaned lambs on and it provides on average this much forage. Can I put more lambs? Is it the right nutritional quality to get them finished as soon as we can? You know, are the lambs finished in a way that our consumer really wants them to be? And so to me, those all tie together. And that's why it's important to sit down and think about it from all these different aspects, right? Or maybe we are perfectly aligning the type of animal with the pasture that we have, with what the consumer wants, but we're not telling them that we have it. So we're not actually getting yeah. that consumer. So it all ties together in one way or another, which forms that big web that's ominous and I mean, it can take weeks of time to put something like this together, but I think in the long run, it's really worth it. Yeah, and I, I don't, I don't know if you feel this way, Melinda, but I feel like the more I talk to um, new sheep producers, you know, some of these people are coming from maybe more cattle background or an equine background, and and they're realizing that some of the resources they have and um, may be more suited towards grazing goats on their operation. And I find this really fascinating in the fact that, you know, agriculture is changing to the extent where it almost seems like we can't be very picky on um, how we choose to manage and, and in order to be profitable or productive, I guess. And so just kind of interesting thought. Um, yeah. we, we do have some questions rolling in. Okay. Um, so, um, here's one question from a, uh, an extension agent in another area who maybe doesn't have as much agriculture background, but uh, they kind of want to know who would they contact in order to develop a business plan similar to this in their area. Um, so would they contact um, maybe a, a bank in an agriculture area to help them create a business plan like this? Um, so looking at these other webinars that have done this, not really sure how to get started in filling out an example like this. Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. And if you're serious about really doing it and moving it forward, my first recommendation would be to hire an accountant. Because if you're in a place with your business that you're profitable enough to want to do this much work, or that you would like to be that profitable, an accountant is a great place to start because they are going to be able to help you with the financial side and the business planning and all of those pieces, especially if you go to an agriculture specializing accountant. However, I know we can't all afford accountants. So um, you could start with your uh, local extension office. And if they are in a position where they don't feel like they can help as much, Chad or I or any of the people um, that we work with can sit down with people to talk about how to get started. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of um, example worksheets that you can Google online to just get you started to see maybe where you're at. The reason that I ended up actually doing this for myself was because I was looking at getting some ag lending to expand my operation. And they, instead of looking at your credit and various other things that you might look at for a mortgage or whatever, a lot of times they want you to do this debt um, to asset ratio or debt to equity ratio. So basically what they're doing is seeing if all of your physical assets, your property, your barns, your trucks, your animals, whatever, can they cover the debt that you're about to go in? And so that's kind of where that started for me. And when I sat down and did just that ratio, it took me, I probably spent a whole day pulling together all my stuff and I had just got done doing my taxes. So it was that much easier, but it's very eye-opening to see the places that you are doing really well and places that you could do better in just from a financial standpoint. 
And then when you think about that in the application side, like how can I improve this? Is it by, you know, getting a better deal on my feeds or is it by having a different type of lamb or more lambs or, or what is it that can actually reach me to a place where I'm doing better in this financial area? And so that's, that's why I brought this talk to you guys was because I had been given the opportunity to realize how important it was for my own, you know, operation. And so, um, I mean, even just starting there, working with a banker, you know, they, that's an option too. So I guess everybody's area is a little different, so I don't have a great um, answer. I think, you know, NRCS could be a place to start because they can help you with the resource side of things. Um, but, you know, we're also available anytime that you need us. So feel free to reach out and we'll try to link you with somebody, if not sit down with you, so. Right. And there's some, like you said, there's some great tools online to some break, break even type budgeting with sheep and goats. And, and a lot of us who are in extension also know extension ag economists who probably could run an Excel sheet and analyze some of these things at a much quicker pace than, than we can. Yeah. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's why I told you right up front, I'm not an econ person, but I yeah. do know how valuable they are. So, but we do. And know sometimes it's just as simple as knowing what to include in yep. in your assets, right? Like yep. I didn't realize all of the equipment that I had in my barn counted, but it does. So, hmm. you know. Well, great. Um, before we move away to more of the animal side of things, there's another question a little bit more on business. What are some of the places? we should look in our local area to identify what our customers actually want? Oh, um, that's a good question. I think that um, you could start, in my mind, I would start, you know, with quizzing some of the restaurants, you know, what, why don't you have lamb on your menu? Um, and if it's because it's a lack of supply, there's an answer. Um, just visiting with friends and neighbors and family, you know, do you eat lamb? Why not? Um, that's kind of, I mean, at a very simplistic level, that's that's kind of how I started in, in the area that I'm in. Um, putting things out on social media, um, you know, providing people with something to be interested in. <laughs> um, you know, we have a, a local person in our area that has a sheep dairy and they do a great job of just social media outreach, um, local grocery stores. It just depends on what kind of niche you're looking for, I guess. Um, if you're the kind of person that wants to put the time in and do a lot of marketing, or if you are just trying to find out if it's even a thing that is worth endeavoring into. So, um, I mean, I, I would certainly reach out to maybe your local butcher, your extension agents. Those people are going to have a pulse on whether or not folks are asking for lamb products or goat products. Um, some places have sale yards somewhat nearby. You could visit with them and see what kind of, you know, sales that they see from week to week or whatever it is. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that may sometimes be overlooked is the ethnic populations. If you're in an area where there's people from outside the country who probably um, enjoy lamb as a product or goat as a product, um, just getting a pulse on the demographics of your area could probably help quite a bit too. Yeah, and, and identifying some of those ethnic markets, and we've had some great speakers on here in the past talking about that, um, may even reflect on your management decisions a little bit, right? I know there's a fairly strong um, a refugee group in the Salt Lake area and, you know, they prefer intact males. And, um, you know, if you could identify groups like that, that are more than willing to buy up almost any animal you could offer them, but may change some of your management, management decisions, it's kind of important to put your thumb on that, so. Yeah. Great. 
Well, I think that's great. Um, now moving into the animal side, we talked about briefly towards the end, Melinda, um, how long should you keep new animals to your flock in a quarantine? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, if, if you can get them in a place that's no nose contact for four to six weeks, that's probably the most ideal. Um, but understanding the management of the animals where they came from is also really important. If they are, you know, um, if they've gone through all the health checks and there's um, no evidence that they have any of the things that you don't have and they have a good vaccine pro program and they're stringent about biosecurity and their operation, you can probably get away with a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, but if they're coming from no man's land and you have no idea, I would try to have that isolation pen um, for one, a, like I said, no nose contact, but also don't use it for anything but isolation, if at all possible, if you're if you're buying animals that you're not aware of the management of where they came from. And there's going to be some sheep and goat diseases that they are lifelong carriers. And so quarantine isn't going to help if you bring them in. <laughs> It just yeah. depends on what you're quarantining or what, why you're quarantining, you know, and what you're willing to accept into your flock. Yep. Oh, great. And, and we do have some other talks on things like that, biosecurity, and uh, maybe we can yeah. hear on the last slide that Melinda still has up, has um, reference to her YouTube channel, the University of Idaho Extension. Um, go back to that, and there are dozens of, of videos and um, presenters who talk specifically on topics that they're experts in, and you can find a lot of good stuff there. Um, well, great. Um, there was kind of one last uh, comment, just kind of talking about the agreements, and you know, a lot of these situations are different depending on your resources or types of animals, and and just more maybe as a compliment overall that. Uh, this was a good, great presentation, um, Melinda, and that <clears throat> that uh, future topics may be on any one of these things, diving in depth may be good, but um, yeah, so thank you very much. Yeah, that's a, that's a great comment, and I think if you guys are interested in, especially the financial side of things, we can certainly find somebody who can be better to speak to that than we would be. And um, that that will be certainly something we'll put on the docket. So we appreciate the feedback. Yep. Um, as a lot of us have probably noticed um, who are in the sheep and goat world, maybe not so much in the goats right now, but sheep prices have slipped a little bit uh, the last couple of weeks. And so I think there's a lot of uh, concern and um, things that we should pencil out on paper, like Melinda talked about during this presentation of, you know, what, what is our objectives? How much money do we need from each animal to stay productive? And um, identifying what the market is giving right now um, is, is really important to make some of those decisions. You know, whereas the last year or so prices have been pretty good and a lot of people have taken that advantage to cull a lot of animals that maybe stayed around the farm a little longer than they should have. Um, but uh, with the slip in prices, it may deter some people from calling as hard this year. So, yeah, um, great. So uh, with that, I just want to remind everyone, uh, I, I think this slide is great that you put this at the end, um, Melinda, is that we do have this webinar the first um, or the second Wednesday of oh. each month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. So, I should change that. <laughs> yeah, so this webinar is the second Wednesday of each month at noon. Uh, feel free to um, tell friends about it, um, to invite people to it, and then also take an active uh, part in giving suggestions of what you want to hear. Um, as we continue this on, we can always reach out to experts in the field or producers that have great examples of how things have been successful for them. And I feel like that has truly been the great experience from this webinar and the people that have reached out and have benefited from it. So <clears throat> we thank you again and um, we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you.
Bye. Thank you all.